The reading from chapter 8, starting at verse 18. Now when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. A scribe then approached and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of his disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. A windstorm arose on the sea, so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And they went and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up and he rebuked the wind and the seas. There was a dead calm. They were amazed, saying, What sort of a man is this, that even the winds and the seas obey him? Hear the word of the Lord. Faith and discipleship. These are the presenting issues in our gospel this morning. And good for us to be reflecting on at this point in your series on Matthew, as we mark St Barnabas Day, one of the early apostles of the church and and as uh, Randall reminded us, the patron saint of this church. The last two patronal festivals, or maybe it's the two two or three, have been particularly significant, of course. I was here for one of them. Uh, A real opportunity, together with Randall, to be envisioning the future, the next 150 years, so to speak, as you look to the future. What does faith and discipleship following Jesus look like for the people of St Barnabas to be mobilised, to make mature and mobilise fully formed disciples of Jesus for the sake of those whom you wish to reach today and in the future, to follow him wholeheartedly. In other words, so thank you for the invitation to be here. For Jesus, the opposite of faith is not unbelief. For Jesus, the opposite of faith is fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of change. Fear of failure. Fear that comes from not being in control. Fear of being alone. Fear of rejection. Fear of death. Fear, which is a roadblock to trust. Fear, which prevents us in whatever form from following Jesus following him wholeheartedly. There is a circularity. (laughs) We see it in the passage of scripture for today. You will remember, I'm not sure how quickly you've been moving through, so whether it's in the last week or two, I'm not sure. But you will remember at chapter 8, verse 1, the beginning of the chapter, great crowds are following Jesus when he comes down the mountain. And as you know, Matthew goes on to recount a number of healings and Jesus casting out of demons. So where we pick it up this morning, there are still great crowds following Jesus and it's really positive. Now when Jesus saw great crowds around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. But before Jesus and his disciples can get into the boat, a scribe then approached and said, Teacher, I will follow you where." Ever you go. The claim, I will follow you wherever you go, leads to two warnings, a bit surprising, but to two warnings from Jesus that have echoed down the centuries. And yes, and I'll come back to those, and yes, 
The disciples get in the boat and follow him, but their trust is tested by fear, which leads them back to Jesus. What sort of man is this? And it's as we keep coming back to this question, what sort of man is this, that we will be sustained, we will be challenged and inspired in our own faith and discipleship. I will follow you wherever you go. The first warning. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Do you really know what you're letting yourself in for? In other words, this is not going to be just an exciting and triumphant march, always on a high of what's happening, following the one who has God's authority, watching him do mighty and powerful things all over the place. It's not just about St Barnabas growing to be a big church again. This is a commitment, a commitment to one whose authority is given in order that he can go to wherever people are, even if that means going to the other side of the lake where there's just lots of very different people. Pagans is the word used in the scriptures. We might call it just you know, socio-demographic change or different generations, whatever. People who are not us. Going to the places also of need, where the world is in its deepest pain and be there for the people who are suffering. Even foxes and birds have places to which they can go when they're tired. Jesus will have none. He has a temporary home in Capernaum, but he's very conscious it's time for him to move on and he's prepared to do that. He will have no place to rest his head until at last it rests on the cross. And that is a humiliating death, not a scene of great triumph in world's terms. Do you really know what you are letting yourself in for? what it really means to put following Jesus first in everything, to put following Jesus first wholeheartedly. How is that question shaping your discernment for the future as the people of this church? Verse 21, another of his disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. The expected response would be, and frankly still is, you must go and do that and, and follow me later. Death is the one thing that takes precedence over everything. For the Jewish people of the time, uh, even saying the Shema, actually, you know, here our Israel, the Lord our God, is the only Lord, and you shall love the God, Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Uh, and and actually, it was quite specific for the rabbis. No, you must bury your father. That is a very serious obligation. But Jesus says to him, follow me and let the dead bury their dead own dead. Now, Jesus maybe had the inside story that, you know, it really was a bit of an excuse because his father hadn't actually died yet and maybe it was even just talking about a future obligation that he would have. I have aged parents, I can't move from here and, and so on. Uh, you know, so really, you know, keeping the options op open. We don't know that and it's interesting. What re people really hear is the shock of it, I think, even now. Let the dead bury their own dead. That is not a very tactful thing to say. But the message is, the warning is, 
Jesus is doing the one thing that really matters, so important, so urgent, so immediate, that whatever else you're thinking of doing, this comes first. This is the priority. Do you really know what you're letting yourself in for, what it really means? What are you prepared to see as unimportant, to let go of, to be really taking on board what it means to follow Jesus today? Both yourself and as a church. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. Do the disciples know what it really means? A gale arose on the lake so great that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep, Jesus. And they went and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid, you of little faith? The sea had always been a symbol of wild, untamable power. How would Matthew's audience have heard this miracle story at the time? It's worth reflecting on that. The sea remained in Jewish writing a place and a power of darkness and evil, threatening and wild. And as we're reminded in our prayers, God creating good, something that was good, God created the work, the, God created what was good out of the primal element, the dark substance out of which and in opposition to the creator God makes a beautiful world, winning a victory over the sea and all it stands for. And the stories about the sea in the Old Testament, uh, there aren't many if you think about it, actually make the same point. Think of the Exodus and also crossing the, the uh, Red Sea and also the Jordan later. The Lord is able to have control over those seas. And also, in the Old Testament, we hear of how a storm is used to stop the disobedient prophet Jonah in his tracks and send him back about his proper business. You can read those four chapters. It's only short this afternoon. Very wet. Good to be reading. Jonah, the prophet who, like Jesus, was called to go to the pagans. Jonah was called by God to go to a place called Nineveh. But unlike Jesus, Jonah went in the opposite direction, took a boat in actually the opposite direction, and a storm wind arose, but Jonah slept, if you recall the story. They woke him up, the, all the people on the boat, how can you sleep so deeply? Arise, call on your God to save us. Only when they'd thrown G Jonah overboard did the storm sub subside. So the parallel, the similarities are very striking. But also is the difference. Jesus does put Jonah very much in the shade. This storm hasn't come up because Jesus refused to do what his father wanted. No, it's a further sign of Jesus' own authority. It's stormy and the disciples are afraid. Jesus is sleeping peacefully. In the midst of the raging waves, the sea itself rises up against him and Jesus is asleep. There's as much mystery here as when the word through whom all things were created lay asleep in his mother's arms as a child. Wake up. The disciples wake him up, but he doesn't have to call on anyone else, does he? Not even on his father for help. No they don't even have to throw him overboard. In another and greater sign of his absolute authority, he simply rebukes the wind and waves and they quieten down at once. If he's a prophet, he's a greater one than Jonah, as Matthew will remind us later in chapter 12. The difference is also shown in the end, by the end of the Jonah story. Do read the fourth chapter. When Jonah finally lands among the pagans as a real prophet of doom, he goes off on a real tirade. Jesus can also preach a good sermon, a profound sermon, as you have seen, with the Sermon 
on the Mount, chapters 5 to 7 of Matthew. But the God to whom Jesus gives form in word and deed ultimately looks different from the God with whom Jonah has so much difficulty. A gracious and merciful God, described in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, long-suffering and of great kindness. Jonah's story was told as a sign that Israel's God did indeed care for everybody, not just Israel. Jonah's mission was to save Nineveh, a great pagan city, from imminent judgment. So these stories about Jesus are designed to show that what God was doing through him and in him was nothing short of new creation. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? The opposite of faith, as I said, is not unbelief, but fear. Matthew's audience would also have heard the Psalms in what Jesus is saying and what is happening. They were only a small group and they were persecuted. It wasn't easy being one of the early Christians. And they cry out in their distress, early Christians, with the pious, the holy ones of Israel. Psalm 44. Awake, Lord. Why do you sleep? Rouse yourself. Do not reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? As an aside, if you're ever struggling to pray to God, look up the Psalms. If you're angry with God, it'll give you the words, pretty good ones. They would have heard the battle of faith from previous generations in the Psalms. They also in the Psalms would have heard the confidence that believers of former times were given. Psalm 107. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the mighty waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven, they went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their calamity. They reeled and staggered like drunkards and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he brought them out of their distress. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad because they had quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. They would have recognised, in other words, the fears of so many before them in peril on the sea of life. But in the presence of Jesus, they nevertheless felt safe and secure in time and for eternity. They were safe. The storm was stilled. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, you of little faith? Why be so afraid when it is stormy? When we are in a place which does engender fear, but we don't need to. With God, aren't we in good hands? These are the hands, as we think of another psalm, that wove us in our mother's womb, the hands which bear us up day and night and which will one day lead us to the other shore, our desired haven, our place of rest. Faith is not a general religious response to the world around. A religious response to a great storm at sea might be awe or terror or, you know, a frightened prayer. <laughs> the faith we talk about as Christians is quite simply trust. Trust which overcomes fear. A trust that Jesus is sovereign. 
who has authority over all the elements. The disciples, ironically, at this point, did not have much of this faith, even though they had seen quite a bit to date. Unlike the centurion, don't forget him, in the early part of chapter 8, who had complete faith in what Jesus could do for his servant. That's where he placed his hope. Matthew has been making it clear that, you know, we might struggle, but there are plenty of people, it is there, you can have that complete trust. The disciples do, however, start to ask questions. They were amazed, saying, what sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? And the thing I'll give the disciples is they are asking the right question. They are asking a very good question. What sort of man is this? Yes, he's a leader. Yes, he's a healer. But they are even seeing his authority stretch beyond that to the natural elements as well. What sort of man is this? It's the question that Matthew will keep on asking as he fills out a more picture, even more what Jesus' authority looks like as you keep reading. They, the disciples need that to come to a full understanding. And as I said at the beginning, it's the question we keep coming back to. What sort of man is this? Do we actually see Jesus for his authority his authority over every aspect of our lives. But that's what it means to follow him wholeheartedly. Yes, the cost is a high. Foxes have dens. Sorry, I've forgotten the, the line. It's funny, you know, quite ironically, I, li I hear that and it's a good reminder for me. Because, see, if I had to say what is the cost of ministry in my own life, she means as I look towards my retirement, which I do, I do, beyond um, next year and a little bit further. The thing is, you know, the truth is, John and I don't really belong anywhere because we've moved so often in ministry. So we don't really have a place where we say, you know, um, that's where we are just going to stay or that's where we truly belong, we'll go back to. You know, we've just sort of got to make it up, you know. But honestly, what cost is that? What cost is that, plus the richness of all the people I've met along the way and the fulfilling roles that I've had, what cost is that? Jesus could, knew that he had no home. And he, as I said, he rested his head on the cross. The cost is high, but it's worth it. And we don't need to fear it when we recognise Jesus for who he is. We trust as we follow Jesus wholeheartedly to where and with whom we need to be. Where and with whom and what he is calling us to be.